up everybody welcome back to my channel uh before we get started i just want to say every single one of y'all are awesome uh thank you so much for 180 subscribers uh thank you for liking and commenting on my videos with all, with all the with all love um i spent two to three hours looking through all the comments looking through all the suggested videos you have so i'm trying not to miss any or whatever um i wrote down a bunch a bunch of them and i'm going to try to get i'm going to try to um get to all of them so there's a lot but it gives me a lot of videos to do too so and i'm going to try my hardest to shout out anybody that suggested so um we are going to do the 1992 uh documentary of the dream team i'm going to do it in parts because it's pretty long um but that's cool with y'all I'm going to try to post them, you know, one after another, hopefully. Uh, all right, let's get into it. Yeah, put these bad boys on. the greatest team ever assembled in the history of team sports. God bless you, and God bless America. 20 years can go by pretty fast, and the world isn't gonna stop and wait for you to remember what it used to look like. 1992 was a time of change. New faces in America quickly transforming into cultural icons. None more so than the superstars of the NBA. The Bulls have repeated. Let the party begin. After the legends of the 80s had lifted the league's profile to new heights, a fresh crop of players had blown the lid off. Their talents and their charisma made them more than just basketball players. I am not a role model. They were a new kind of star athlete. Pop yeah, I totally miss the days when uh, uh, basketball, like when big men, you know, was paid their dues. You know what I mean? Like uh, they were actually super important. You know what I mean? There was a lot of them, and they were just dominant. And, I don't know, I just missed that. I am not a role model. They were a new kind of star athlete whose popularity transcended the game. Mike, Mike. If I could be like Mike. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be like Mike. Is it the shoes? No, Mom. And now the very best of them awaited their brightest showcase, the world's largest athletic stage, the Olympic Games in Barcelona, Spain, even if no one truly realized the impact they would make there. It's a watershed moment in the history of sports, not just, not just the Olympics, not just basketball, 
Um, it, it, it moved the culture along. But in 1992, not everyone was ready for them. Not everyone thought pro basketball stars had a place in the Olympics. This kind of thing had never, ever, ever been done. So there was a lot of, you know, poking the bear, if you will, by people in my profession. Sports journalists and journalists in general were skeptical, angry, you know, because this wasn't the Olympic movement. The Olympic ideal had always been about amateur competition, which meant the United States had always sent basketball teams made up of college kids, teams that dominated for decades. Premier, Etats Unis. Benjamin Youth Pros. In 1972, the Soviet Union was awarded a victory over the U.S. in a controversial gold medal game. The United States apparently had won the game, but the debate still goes on. To this day, that American team still hasn't claimed their silver medals. What? What do you mean, like, America supposedly won the game? What does that even mean? That American team still hasn't claimed their silver medals. But that result seemed like a fluke when the Americans got the gold in their next two Olympic appearances. The U.S. has its ninth gold medal. While the U.S. celebrated, though, the rest of the world was catching up. So in 1988, when the Soviets won again, there was no talk of any fluke. The United States goes home with a semi-final loss to the bigger, more experienced USSR team. I was embarrassed. I know some of the guys left their medals there in the room. They didn't want to take them home. And here we are. Um, USA on our chest, and we didn't get the job done. But the amateur ideal had gotten muddled. While NBA players were prohibited from Olympic competition, professionals from other leagues abroad could play. If you played in Europe for money, you were an amateur, but if you played in the NBA for money, you were a professional. Is yeah, this bull crap? Oh. This, I mean, I understand that the United States the majority, I think, have the best basketball players, but was it Tony Parker, Ginobili, and all them, you know? I don't get why they considered NBA pros if they made money off of it, but the other countries considered them as amateurs if they made money. That don't make any sense. Amateur, but if you played in the NBA for money, you were a professional, and so our players weren't eligible. Those other countries were using pros. Playing against 18, 19 year old kids. That is really unfair. Yeah, that's cool. Changing the hypocrisy, though, was a central goal of a European named Boris Stankovic, the head of FIBA, the World Basketball Federation. He was very much intent on lifting basketball up to the highest possible level of international sports. And if the whole world knew, that the very best players in the world were not participating in the Olympics, that made it a second-class event. So in 1989, Stankovic issued a resolution to allow pros from all leagues to compete in the Olympics. But back in America, the NBA was lukewarm to the idea. We wanted to be good partners with FIBA to grow the sport of basketball, but we weren't particularly anxious. We didn't know what it would mean. We didn't know if our players would want to do it. We didn't know what the logistics were, but the vote passed and NBA players were eligible for the Olympics. Now the issue wasn't about whether American pros could play, but whether the best players wanted to play. The one guy that, you know, that we were a little concerned about was probably Michael. The thought back then was, Michael Jordan plays 36 holes of golf 90 days during the summer. What the hell is he going to be doing playing basketball? I was hoping they would not ask me to participate. And uh, I was trying to figure out a way, graciously, that I could decline. I'd done the Olympic thing before, and when Rod Thorne called me and asked me, I wasn't gung-ho about it. My appeal to him was, you're the top player in the world. This is bigger than the NBA Finals. And, you know, we need you. His thing, well, who else is playing? 
I mean, are all the good players going to play? You know, I'm not going to play by myself. So Michael Jordan waited to hear more. And Rod Thorne made his next call. It was a no-brainer for me. <laughs> you know, I was in from day one. And I figured if I jumped in first and said I wanted to play, that would get guys to want to participate as well. I think if Ma That makes sense. I would want to play with Magic for sure. But I can't believe how much they really wanted Michael. You know, they were like, like, uh, they really want him to play. Seems like more than anybody. Maybe it would, uh, I don't know. I guess it was top player at that time, maybe. I don't know. Larry and Magic were still playing, though, so I don't know. To want to participate as well. I think if Magic wasn't on that team, I don't think it would have been as spectacular as it was. And uh, to finish out our careers, that was important for both of us. Once you get guys like Magic and Larry committing to the team, then all of a sudden it, it becomes something very, very special. Um, representing the USA is already a, a tremendous honor, but to know that you're going to be on a dream team is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Magic, Bird, and David Robinson weren't alone in their pride. They called in the big guns. We're the Navy SEALs that we had to go over there and kick butt and take names. With those stars and the Utah Jazz tandem of John Stockton and Carl Malone, the dream team was starting to take shape. They got them both it over. don't matter if you call me last. I got the call. I didn't feel like that I deserved to be called, but uh, I truly uh, wasn't going to tell them that. <laughs> he, definitely, he definitely deserved to be there. I don't know what he's talking about, but Michael did not do it by himself. I know there's a lot of uh, Scotty Pippen haters out there, but yeah, Michael didn't do it by himself. Scotty is actually very underrated. Uh, he, I've, I've seen one or two of his games, not live, but like I've seen a couple, and he, he was doing stuff pretty much like Michael. Like I was like, what in the world? I truly uh, wasn't going to tell them that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm in. I didn't even think to say who else was on the team. I, that was it. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yes. Charles Barkley's ability was never in question. Why is but his attitude was. The, uh, God wants us to win the world championship. <laughs> I don't know if I go that much, y'all. No, no, I talked to him the other night. I learned early in Philadelphia. It doesn't matter what I say. So from this day forward, I'm going to say what the hell I want to say. And some people are going to like it, and some people are going to dislike it. But after a series of incidents on and off the court, the least of the committee's concerns were about what Barkley would say. I was asked to talk to him. He was so honored that we would even think about asking him. He convinced me that uh, you won't have any problems with me. Now, with the team nearly complete, Rod Thorne had enough talent secured to go back to where he started. Representing my country was a big thing. But I think, you know, the biggest motivation for me was now I get to spend time with some of the guys I compete against all the time. Yeah, man, cool. Portland's Clyde Drexler rounded out the list of NBA players, while the final spot on the roster was reserved for an amateur, Duke's Christian Leitner, coming off back-to-back -back NCAA titles. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yes! In any other Olympic year, Leitner might have been the team's biggest star. But on this team, he was fine with being the last guy on the bench. How crazy is that? You get all these Hall of Famers and you get an amateur. How crazy would it be to be that amateur? Well, he's not really amateur. He, I mean, back-to-back -back NCAA championships is pretty good. But uh, dang, dude, I wonder how much, like, pride. I don't know, man. That would be so exciting. Star. But on this team, he was fine with being the last guy on the bench. I tell people this all the time, and it may have shocked play? them, but my most enjoyable year was my freshman year because they don't expect nothing from you except carry the luggage, do the laundry, and, and get our donuts. And that's the easy. <laughs> the harder thing is to be the leader. By May of 1991, 
two months before the Olympics, the team was set. One college kid and 11 future Hall of Famers. The man charged with putting it all together was the unflappable Chuck Daly. Okay, all set? All set. Chuck looked the part. He was the guy that looked like he owned the arena, but he would also push the broom. His hair was beautiful. His suits were immaculate. He wanted to win, but he wanted to look good. As the head coach of the Detroit Pistons, kind of like mob, Daly yeah. did both, winning back-to-back -back championships in 1989 and 90. The Pistons are winners Pistons and coach? still champions of the world. The Pistons were nicknamed the Bad Boys for their aggressive and some said dirty style of play, never more evident than in their memorable playoff battles with Michael Jordan's Bulls. Michael on the move against Vinnie Johnson to the hoop. He is necktied. Oh. Michael Jordan goes down hard. Detroit and Chicago had no love for each other. So when Daly was named the dream team coach, many wondered how he'd handle working with the Bulls' biggest star. I was being asked to wrestle with some demons and some, some issues. But the coach was well acquainted with the task of managing personalities. He coached the bad boys. And if you can coach those you can coach anybody. One player Daly wouldn't Makes be sense. coaching in the Olympics, however, was his own star in Detroit, point guard Isaiah Thomas, who controversially had been left off the team's roster. No matter how much people try to say now, you know, it was no big a deal. Uh, it was a big deal. Uh, I talked to Isaiah at the beginning of the year uh, about the aspect he wasn't on the team, and uh, he was not comfortable with it. Uh, I'm sure he is very hurt. He's a very deserving player. But, uh, you know, he was not selected. Thomas was well on his way to a Hall of Fame career, but was also seen by many as the biggest cultivator of the bad boy's image in Detroit. And now Isaiah Thomas and Hart Rider swinging. Isaiah was the general. He was the guy that would yap at his teammates and say, knock him on the ass, do whatever you got to do. A beautiful backdoor pass from Pippen, and he is qualified. He knew he was going to get hit. I despise the way that he played the game. Did you want him on the dream team? No, I did not want him on the team. Did Michael, did he want him on the team? Well, I can't speak for Michael, but uh, I don't think he wanted him on the team. <laughs> now, there has been speculation that your icy relationship with Isaiah Thomas is the reason that he was not selected. Well, what is your reaction to that? That was one of the stipulations put to me prior to me even committing that uh, Isaiah wasn't a part of the team. I was getting strong innuendos that it wasn't just, you know, it was coming from higher places that didn't want Isaiah Thomas on the team. Certainly things are being pointed at me because of our relationship at, uh, and of course about the, the way that the, the end of the game between Detroit and Chicago uh, ended. We were picking the group just after the Pistons had been eliminated by the Bulls, and it was a very bad timing uh, for Isaiah. Everybody had fresh in their mind the picture of Isaiah walking off the court. Pistons wasting no time and getting out of here. They left the bench, although the seven and nine, ten seconds remaining. Nice the stuff, Pistons though. just left. No sports. When the Pistons all. walked off the Mom. court, before the final bell. I, I think it left a bad taste in a lot of people's uh, mouths. Okay. All right, no Isaiah Qu Thomas No Isaiah stuff. Thomas questions. Cool. Though. Jordan and the team were done answering questions about Isaiah. But with training camp approaching, a bigger question would need to be answered. Hello, how you doing? How would the 12 stars that were selected play together? Welcome. That's the end of uh, part one, but... Uh... I was going to say, man, that, that team, all the players on that team, dude, they must have won every game. But I understand what they're, what they're talking about, about the Isaiah thing, though. You know, it's kind of hard to want to put that on the uh, same team as Michael. But then again, Isaiah probably deserved to be on the team, though. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on that one. But uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you all for watching. Uh, I'm out. Mm -hmm.